Welcome to Speak for Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley, that dude. Coming up, we'll tell you if the Cowboys can hang with the Saints this Thursday. And if the Ravens should stick with Lamar Jackson, at quarterback. But we start every day with a Whitlock. What you got today, big dog? All right, Marcellus, did you know that Steven Spielberg wanted to do a movie about me called The Sixth Scent? Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have a, I can smell championships before anyone else. Myself. I can smell bootleg movies. <laughs> <laughs> First year LeBron went to Miami. I was the only one who could see Dirk Nowitzki and the Mavericks were going to win it all. Mm. When Steve Harvey announced Miss Columbia, I knew immediately that Miss Philippines was the real winner of Miss Universe. Me too. It's just a knack I have. I can smell championship people. Mm. Last night, watching the Houston Texas, Texans dismantled Tennessee 34 to 17. I started smelling another title. Deshaun Watson and J.J. Watt are cooking up something special in Houston. Football is a game of momentum. The two longest winning streaks in the NFL belong to the Saints and the Texans. Everybody's riding the Saints bandwagon right now. Cowherd and everybody else. Sean Payton and Drew Brees have won 10 straight. They're the favorites to win the Super Bowl, the MVP, and the Coach of the Year. But I'm hopping on the Texans bandwagon. They have the most complete team in football. Winners of eight straight. Watson and Watt actually have the best chance of remaining undefeated the last five weeks of the season. And I like their chances of riding Uncle Momentum all the way to the Super Bowl. Sounds like a hot take. It's hmm. not. It's my sixth cent. People <laughs> rolled off and ignored the Texans after their 0-3 start. The offensive brilliance of Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs overshadowed Houston's resurgence. Aaron Donald and Khalil Mack have fooled people into believing J.J. Watt is the third best defensive player in football. In five weeks, when this regular season wraps up, everyone will see what I see. J.J. Watt is still the league's most dominant defender. Deshaun Watson is the league's most dangerous two-way quarterback. Houston is the lone NFL <coughs> team that can take you apart on both sides of the ball. And a sound defense and a formidable running game still form the best recipe for winning a title. I say Watt is more dominant than Donald and Mack because Watt is more disruptive and active in the running game. Watson is the lone NFL quarterback who can absolutely kill you with his arm from the pocket and destroy you with his legs when he leaves the pocket. Watson is Steve Young 2.0. Drew Brees, Jared Goff, Tom Brady, Big Ben, Patrick Mahomes pose little threats to run when leaving the pocket. Houston has the league's fourth best rushing offense and the fifth best scoring defense. When you look at the personnel on both sides of the ball, Houston is just as stacked as the Los Angeles Rams. Watson, Watt, DeAndre Hopkins, Demarius Thomas, Lamar Miller, Jadavian Clowney, Tyron Matthew. They finished the season against the Browns, Colts, Jets, Eagles, and Jaguars. That smells like 12 and 4 or 13 and 3 to me. The Texans now also have an emotional edge, an emotional purpose. They're dedicating the rest of the season to owner Bob McNair, who passed away last week. This is the year of Watt and Watson. All right, joining the desk now is Fox NFL analyst Tony Gonzalez and the NFL Network's Bucky Brooks. Marcellus, yes. watch that game last night. Good game. I smell championship yeah. for the Houston Ooh. Texans. I think they got the ingredients. Lying to America. You smelt them leftovers. <laughs> you know damn well Thanksgiving ain't over. Um, I, Watching that game yesterday, especially down 10-0, then going against almost a perfect passer in the opposing team and Marcus Mariota, I was like, this is going to be a tough one for him. And they pulled that one out, and it did impress me. And I think I'm going to repeat what Booger said after the game in terms of what the Houston Texans are now. Welcome to the conversation of being a tough out in the playoffs. Tough out means, oh, you're going to be in a fight if you play the Houston Texans. Oh, you're going to go home with some scratches on you but they're going to go home. They're not a Super Bowl contending team right now, despite naming all the valuable assets and pieces they have. I'm looking at this team right now. It's an octane conversation we're having. You know, you go to the gas station. You know, if you're like me, you cheat. 87 every time. I don't give a damn. It could be a Ferrari. You're getting 87 out of me. But that's what this offense is. The state of Texas has passed legislation that no quarterback shall ever pass for over 300 yards, including Deshaun Watson last night, despite playing great. So, look, there are 87 octane. And then there's the Chargers, Pittsburgh, New England, 89. 
Then you get that 91 KC Supreme Tehran. And that's what they're going to face if they get to the playoffs. Their tough out is going to be because they don't have enough octane on offense to compete with these high-flying offenses. I think they actually can control the game. I actually like the way they play the game. Two most important stats that you look at for playoff teams. Rush offense because that means they can control the game. Scoring defense. They're fourth in scoring defense. So they'll let Kansas City and all those other high-flying teams move between the 20s, but then they're bogged down. Romeo Cornell, also a disciple of Bill Belichick, understands how to muddy up the game in critical moments. I like the way they play. Everyone has talked about the passing game all year, but you know the game changes after Thanksgiving. Running game, physicality, toughness, and the X factor that they have, their quarterback, Deshaun Watson. Last six games, he hasn't thrown the ball more than 25 times. But that doesn't mean he's incapable of. It just means that the game plan has been such that they're grinding it out. But because he loves the big stage and he plays well in big games, I am confident that if the game is on his shoulders, he'll find a way to win it. I like him, uh, but can they beat Kansas City? Hmm. Can they beat the Chargers? Hmm. Uh, can they beat New England? I, I don't know. I just I don't think, especially if they're going to have to go on the road, they're going to have to, it looks like. Uh, I, I don't see them winning in Kansas City. I don't see them winning in New England. Uh, I like Deshaun Johnson. What he's done is, 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 first of all, he's got one of the best receivers in the NFL. Yes. And let's not ever forget that. First of all, a quarterback, you need, especially a young guy, you need that guy. You just put the ball in his area, he's going to make plays. And Demarius Thomas, Thomas, they are really settling in, getting him in plays where he likes the ball, mm -hmm. which, I, you know, people are like, oh, Will Fuller, he's going to take Will Fuller's spot. They, they designed the plays around him. And he, give credit to O'Brien for that. Uh, I, I like this team. Defensively, J.J. Watt is a beast. He's right up there at the top. He looks like he's getting back into form, and he's only going to keep getting better. Confidence is good. I like this team, but at this point, I'm not prepared to say they're going to win the Super Bowl. Let, let, let me push back on hmm. your deal that I, Houston's going to have to go on the road. Again, look at their finishing schedule as compared to everyone else in the NFL, and I think they have a path to get home field advantage in the AFC. Hmm. Uh, again, they can get to 13 and three if or 12 and four. I think at worst, when I look at their final, the Browns, Colts, Jets, Eagles, and Jaguars, the Colts are going to be a problem. Everybody else is out of the playoff race, uh, including the Eagles. Even though you know, I guess mathematically they can still win the NFC East, but they're not playing that well. The road to the Super Bowl in the AFC could very well go through Houston. No doubt, um, and they've already beat the Colts, so you got to yeah. respect that. If you look at the teams that they have beaten. A little bit of bottom feeding in terms of the Colts, Cowboys, Bills, Jags, Dolphins, Broncos, Redskins, Titans. Didn't really mention any contending teams in there. Uh, you know, Grandma's fish tank had that little sucker fish at the bottom. So, <laughs> remember that with that big mouth? I'm like, Grandma, what's that one doing? Just eating all the algae at the bottom. And that's what they've been doing, but gaining confidence in that process. Even with home field, I don't think I'm going to see a Patrick Mahomes who put 40 up in New England, regular season, went to L.A., went out there and put up 51. I don't think that he's going to be intimidated by going to Houston if, they, if that's the case. Whatever it may be, I think a team can travel to Houston despite their running attack and still outscore them. Look, I don't think Patrick Mahomes or anybody is going to be intimidated. Everybody's a baller at this point. Yeah. I just think J.J. Watt mm -hmm. and Jadavian Clowney mm -hmm. in combination with the other defensive players they have – are just problems that I just don't know if these offensive lines in the AFC can really solve. J.J. Watt, for all the hype, and Aaron Donald certainly deserves it, and Khalil Mack certainly deserves it. He got traded. They've been stealing the headlines, but J.J. Watt just keeps chopping wood. 11 and a half sacks. He's, play, he's more effective in the running game than Donald or Khalil Mack. J.J. Watt is still the most dominant defensive player in the NFL, and any nobody, the Saints... Uh, certainly can't say that. The Chiefs certainly don't have anybody comparable. New England doesn't have anybody comparable. We'll see what Nick Bosa does with uh, the Chargers the rest of the season. And obviously the Rams have Aaron Donald. But I just think J.J. Watt is still the man on the defensive side of the ball. And I think Deshaun Watson's best days are ahead of him even this season. I think the point about the trench play really matters because you talk about J.J. Watt. It's not just J.J. Watt. It's his partners that he brings with him. Jadavian Clowney, Whitney Merkulis, those guys being able to create a pass rush. They're one of the few teams. They won't have to blitz to get home. So now when you're playing the high-powered Kansas City Chiefs, they can drop seven. They can drop eight and still get a pass rush. I just like the way this defense is positioned because even though it's been a like pass-happy league, we've seen all kinds of record numbers. 
the game slows down in the postseason. I just believe that they can make you play half-court basketball. Hmm. And when you have Deshaun Watson, I think he can finish it if the game is like that. Yeah. You look at those the, the running backs, that because I think that's where you got these good, high-powered off- defenses that can get after that quarterback. I think what has really helped, first of all, the rules, the way it's set up for the, mm-hmm. for the offense to win, that's what they want and it's what you see right now. But Kareem Hunt. I think that can be an extension. You're not going to have to sit back there. Andy Reid is a beautiful play caller. I think Phillip Rivers, Melvin Gordon, depending on how healthy he is, he's one of those guys that can catch those quick screens, those quick passes, extension of the run game uh, to slow them down, slow that defense down. And then Tom Brady, who's been better in the NFL history of being patient and taking what the defense gives you. I love this team. I think, and I'm not going to be shocked if they get to the Super Bowl. But I just think right now, for me, those other teams have an advantage. Well, let's talk about J.J. Watt. I mean, when you talk about He's different than Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald's playing amazing, not taking anything away from him. Khalil Mack, insane. J.J. Watt, if you look at his resume, two times over 20-plus sacks. Two times, and then he followed that up with a 17-and-a-half sack season. This year, 11-and-a-half. And this is a guy who's still trying to play himself into form, into shape, and into confidence, as you said, Tony. What's amazing about J.J. Watt is – most offense alignment have already given up a sack to him as soon as they see him on the field. Yeah. Like, like this dude's superhero strength and leverage. We talk about leverage, which is coming from the root word lever. The dude's levers, his length, and the fact that he's forcing fumbles at a career rate, five forced fumbles. He can score. He can not only create opportunities for you to score, he can take it into the end zone himself. He's a disruptor. When you talk about playoff football, special igniting plays, J.J. Watt still is the standard for all the And linemen. that's what I thought we saw last night. Marcus Mariota played a hell of a game. But J.J. Watt, because and again, we'll talk about this later in the show when we talk about how to evaluate quarterbacks, but J.J. Watt and Covington and that pass rush knocked this dude down six times. Those six sacks, they're almost like turnovers now. Sacks are. They're so valuable. So even though a quarterback went 22 of 23 passing for 300 and some odd yards, mm-hmm. they scored 17 points yeah. because of the sacks, because of the disruptive factor of a J.J. Watt. And so it's one of those deals where Patrick Mahomes, love him to death, he may put up huge numbers, but if they knock him down a few times and create third and longs and things and get him off the field that way, the numbers will be great, but they will not score points just like Tennessee didn't last night. J.J. Watt, in, in here, you're talking about J.J. Watt coming back. I don't think anyone saw this coming, coming off of back-to-back leg and back injuries. You didn't expect him to play at the level that he played at when he was a three-time defensive player of the year. Mm. But his ability to dominate at the line of scrimmage is a problem, and it's really more problematic because the guys that he has with him. Jadavion Clowney can win one-on-ones. Whitney Merkles can win one on one. So when you face the Texans, you have to figure out where are we going to slide the protection to, who do we want to neutralize, and the other guys can win. Most teams, particularly in the AFC, they don't have offensive lines that are built to deal with three pass rushes at the point of attack. The Texans have a huge advantage. J.J. Watt is leading the way, but it's the homeboys mm. that are a problem. Mm. You're, you're, really? J.J. J. J. Watt's better than, and than, uh, than Aaron Donald right now? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, Khalil Mack, I mean, it's just, just – I, I know – hey, I'll take, I'll take all of them. Oh. I said it's the Ferrari, the Bugatti, the, <laughs> uh, the, the Rolls Royce. Which one do you want? But – I, I really like Aaron Donald right now. I think right now he's he's playing at the top of, of not of his as game. effective in the running game, in my opinion. I give you that too. Not, not as disruptive in the yeah, running. Yeah, that's game. why they get gassed in their running game, and yeah. that's what Kansas City should have did. You were saying when mm-hmm. they played the Rams, like you you're supposed to attack those pass rushers, attack J.J. Watt just because of leverage, just because of dimensions. He's still going to have impact in the running game. He sets the edge. He creates turnovers. He's disruptive. And then he finishes off with a bowl and says, here's the sack force combo as well. Next level. Time for a big story. Whitlock and Wiley, Tony Gonzalez and Bucky Brooks are back. Let's move to Baltimore, where the Ravens got another win with Lamar Jackson under center, beating the hapless Raiders Sunday. Lamar is now 2-0 since Joe Flacco went down with a hip injury, but Baltimore could have a tough decision this week as they get set to face the Falcons. John Harbaugh announced that Flacco could be back at practice as early as tomorrow. And if he is back at practice, Hmm. I think they should reinstall him as the starting quarterback of the Baltimore Ravens. No disrespect to Lamar Jackson. I think he's gained some confidence as well you should playing against the Bengals and the Oakland Raiders. Uh, And so... 
listen, I, I don't want to sound like I'm piling on Lamar. He's gained confidence. But when you really dig into what he's done here, he beat the Bengals and the Raiders, two of the worst defenses, two teams plummeting and, and in free fall. Uh, and, you know, he ran the ball nicely in the first game, I think, against the Bengals. Uh, second game, I thought he struggled in the passing game. Did some nice running in the second half, led him to a victory. But he is not the, ready to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. I think this is a perfect time to put Joe Flacco back in before you leave Lamar out there too long mm. and you undermine his confidence. Uh, I agree with your uh, assessment of him at the position. Um, He's not a good quarterback right now. Let's just be real about that. Uh, he is gaining confidence. He is starting to feel more comfortable, but he is still miles away from what you expect from him as a dual threat in the pocket. Uh, with that said, I still say you stick with Lamar Jackson. Um, you're grading him, and I can grade him, but this isn't the class he's in. He's in the pass-fail class, and the grade is win or loss. And he's won twice, and even in failing quarterback efforts, He's still a winning quarterback, and he's brought juice to this team. The defense is playing better. You can say whatever you want. I know I've been on a team with a quarterback change before. Rob Johnson and Doug Flutie. All of a sudden, the number one defense got even better than we were playing before because now, one, you go to the sidelines, you're like, we got a, we got a few minutes. He's going to control this run attack. He's going to get outside the pocket. Uh, and also the juice that's coming in the running attack as well. So Lamar Jackson in a pass fail, not a letter grade class. Keep him out there while them W's still adding up. Got to stay with him. You just look at all the numbers, all the numbers. It's, he's playing better than Joe Flacco. What, what, whoa, 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 what, what, number? what, what numbers? What numbers? I ain't see that. Points per game are up. They're averaging 29 points well, that, per game. He's getting credit Joe for Flacco the was return. He get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all I know, all I know is when he's out there, the points That's are up. That's juice. Okay. Yeah. Yards, total yards are up. Right. Running game yards are up. Mm. 254. They've been over 250. Yeah. You play defense. Yeah. It's tough when they're running it down your throat. This plays to the way Baltimore wants to play. If you think about the organization, they've always been a defense-first organization. Well, now they can run the ball. Gus Edwards, who? Undrafted free agent has back-to-back 100-yard games. It's because Lamar Jackson is there controlling. It's the threat of the run that has created opportunities. Is he a finished product? No. They try to do too much in the passing game for him. He doesn't throw the ball well outside the numbers. He's a guy that needs to throw inside the numbers, simple concepts. But his ability to run the ball is a game changer. They need to stick with him because they're hot and the team is energized by his presence. Yeah, you know, and they'll, and they'll stick with him, I think. I don't think they're going to put Flacco back in there. You know what he's uh, – he, this guy was a first-round pick. I mean, you got to put him in there. If he's going to be so your – Tim Tebow. Yeah, but if he's going to be your franchise quarterback – and he's winning, he's won in the, But he won these two games. I agree with so you. So did Tim Tebow. I don't think – and this is a question, I think. <laughs> I don't think – he is a franchise quarterback. I don't think he's going to be in this league very long, especially playing the way he does. He's going to get hit eventually. These defenders are going to come up and start tattooing him, and it, it doesn't last too long. Coach Marvin Lewis said it after the game. You're not going to see, okay, yeah, he ran the ball 27 sour, times. Sour, sour grace from Mike, grace Michael from Vick. Mm, the, sour remember Michael Vick? He said the most he's ever ran the ball was 15, 15. times. That's Michael mm -hmm. Vick. This guy ran the ball 27 times, 11 times last week. He, it's not sustainable, nope. uh, and I think if, as an organization, if we missed, if we if we miss on this guy, but he's winning games right now, I'd keep him in there because I don't think Flacco's going to be back there no matter what happens next year. Let's be real about Joe Flacco, and we've all been there uh, in that position where incentives shape behavior, and the incentives for this organization is to not play Joe Flacco. They're not they're not in a position that's desiring Joe Flacco to go out there and earn more money at that rate versus Joe Flacco at his rookie wage scale as a 32nd pick. Uh, he's a cheaper product. He has more runway. We can keep him longer. Mm -hmm. So when, when there's a tie or this conversation we're having, there are numbers that support Joe Flacco. Uh, interception rate, uh, more passes for more yards, same touchdown rate. There are numbers that support Joe Flacco. But, damn, do we want to put him back out there for 20-plus million? Mm -mm. No, no, no. Mm -mm. So those incentives shape the behavior. I think Lamar stays. Uh, listen, we got to remember, John Harbaugh is coaching for his life. Yes. And, and I do believe there's a little bit of strategy here in terms of the Bengals and the Raiders were the perfect team just to jam it down their throat and with the running game. But now as they move into the rest of this schedule, I just don't think you're going to just jam this running game down their throat because what Tony's saying is, yeah, they're going to break little 
uh, Black Tebow in half. Black Tebow? <laughs> Black Tebow has never suffered an injury. He's mm. never missed a game. He, has he gained more rushing yards than Saquon Barkley in college. He ran a ton and never it's set out. Let him know. I'm it's just, the, I'm just saying, the, like, this is who he is. When you draft him, you get to know RG3 never got he hurt either. RG3 was a NFL. track star. RG3 was a straight line runner. These are different dudes. Mm. Completely different dudes. Listen. And I, the RG3 comparison, I do think there's some truth there, but I really think the Tebow comparison in terms of the intangibles that we're tossing on to Lamar. Now he's responsible for kick and punt returns. <laughs> now the defense is playing better because Lamar's out there, and they're all happy because Lamar's out. Uh, Michael Crabtree calls it the Lamar show. Yeah. yeah the, Lamar, the Lamar show included two horrible interceptions and him pushing the ball downfield, not throwing it. It's not a Lamar show. It's a nice little gimmick that beat up the, the Bengals and the Raiders. And again, I, I'm, listen, I'm for protecting the kid. His confidence is high. Everybody feels good about him. Let Flacco go out there and do the real work and let Lamar get into the offseason ride seen Flacco. Line We've confidence. seen his work. We've, We've seen, seen his work. We've years seen and that. years of his work. His, it, it, one of I'm, his work got him a Super Bowl. Kind of. Yeah, I, I mean, Oh, no, kinda, don't do no kind of thing. I'm Ray, sitting over Ray here with Rice none of them. Those other guys, <laughs> Me and Tony over here with nothing. Yeah. Talking about kind of. They yeah, don't give I out kind of rings. They yeah. don't get a ring and you don't get a ring. Don't give me that. Hey, here's the thing. I don't, I don't accept the connotation. I think you're trying to send when you say Tebow. You're sending that with a negative connotation. You're sending yeah. it like yes. that. I didn't like very, Tebow. Well, that's your issue. Consistent. But you know what? If I was on that team that won seven of eight games, I don't care what the imagery is. It, that's the thing about NFL evaluators. It has to look the part and play the part. Hold on. What's more important? Do you get the job done? At the end of the day, can we pop some champagne? At the end of the day, can we go out and poke our chest out? Yeah, under Lamar Jackson, this is an undefeated team. You got into a whole Tebow argument and imagery. Oh, it doesn't look like he could throw it. Did he complete a pass? Did he win a playoff game? Like, I'm into results. I'm sorry I'm not into but the you optics. got to remember, the reason they drafted him in the first round is because they were bringing him in to replace Flacco. Yes. And so yeah. that is why they're definitely not going to put Flacco back out there at this point. It just he's making he's sense. He won two games, and he's, he's the future of our franchise. This is heaven why sent. Would, why would we get rid of franchise? franchise. Yeah, if they stick guys. him back out, first of all, Ozzie Newsome, who drafted him, is leaving. Damn but Eric DaCosta, whoever is replacing Damn good him, chance Harbaugh's going to get fired. And so now you're going to have a new head coach and a new GM, and they all get to wash their hands from Lamar no, if it doesn't. Yes, there. they do. He's if it there. doesn't work out. He's there. He's there. He's going to be there for the long time. You don't. Are you rooting for him to be? Well, well, why am I rooting? I, I come up here and talk facts. Was I, am I rooting against But after, the facts after, would be he's undefeated, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, after a 2-0 and start, you're saying he's out of here. They're going to wash no, their yeah. hands with him. Listen. Tebow won seven or eight games that I never bought the hype. It, it wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. it, it, I ain't saying nothing different than what Tony said. The guy's not, right now, a franchise quarterback. It's a long developmental process that I'm telling you, right now I would be worried about protecting his confidence more than sticking back out there and crediting him with punt returns and everything else. He made T. Sizzle get to the zone. <laughs> he got Sizzle. Yeah. You see yeah. Sizzle first making moves? Time. First time yeah, first time in 10 years he yeah. gets into the zone. Terrell Suggs scores touchdown. It's Lamar. Lamar gets credit for anything. If I lose a pound this week, <laughs> it's Lamar Lamar in this conversation. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the show. Whitlock and Wiley, Tony Gonzalez and Bucky Brooks are back. Let's move to Dallas. And the Cowboys-Saints matchup Thursday night, which has some huge implications for the NFC playoff pitcher. While Dallas has been hot of late, winning three in a row and taking over first place in the NFC East, Drew Brees and the Saints have been hot all year and are arguably the best team in the NFL. Even still, Dak Prescott says his team is feeling good about the matchup. Yeah, as I said, we have all the confidence ourselves. We're not going out there and getting awed by another team. Uh, they put on the pants the same way we do. I mean, they've won 10. I guess we've won three. So, as I said, we're going to take it one game at a time, uh, and that's all that matters, and we have a lot of confidence in ourselves. A lot of pressure on Dak Prescott to me going into this game. This, he, he can't get blown out here. He's going to have to score some points, uh, t 28, maybe 30 points. If they lose with a nice offensive performance, mm. score one for Dak. If he can't keep pace with Drew Brees and they get routed here in, in an ugly fashion, uh, that's going to be a knock against Dak Prescott. And those, that three-game winning streak is going to look a little inflated. I see a lot of pressure here on Dak Prescott, and, and 
I actually think he's going to live up to it. I'm not saying he's going to lead the Cowboys to victory, but I think they're going to be into this in this game well into the fourth quarter. Oh, well, they're playing with house money. Uh, the expectations being that they should lose to the Saints. Um, but then you get into the, the other dynamics. You talk about, but how much uh, did you keep pace? Uh, that can obviously be a, a conversation that can undermine their confidence or give them confidence, even in a losing effort. But as excited as I am for this Thursday night matchup, I'm even more excited for the pregame show. Because when they show that Dallas hotel and all them limos that the Saints are sending for them <laughs> Cowboys to show up, they go beat the brakes off these boys. I'm telling you, the Saints are rolling at a place and at a clip that the Cowboys office, what have we always said? If Zeke goes off, they win. They're 5-1 and one when Zeke gets 100-plus. But even in those efforts, talking about Octane, talking about not enough firepower, talking about Dak Prescott won't throw for 300 yards and he won't do it against this Saints defense, this could get ugly. Even though it may give the Cow Cowboys confidence playing with that house money, I think this score is going to get out of hand. Man, like just – Beat down. Man, no way. Nope. Like, I, I, I love what I'm seeing from the Cowboys. I think the Cowboys have found their identity. I think they understand exactly who they are. It runs through Zeke. Amari Cooper coming over has really opened up the offense, has allowed Dak Prescott to be very, very comfortable. And really it just comes down to him not giving the ball away. Yep. When they don't give the ball away, they win a ton of games, 22 and 2 when he doesn't have a giveaway. So all he has to do is play within the framework of the offense. This team, defensively, is good enough to keep this game – into the fourth quarter, and I think they are prime to get picked off. Bucky, I'm going to disagree Saints. with you, though. Uh -oh. I think they're I, prime I, to get knocked I just don't think the Saints are a game where the quarterback can just play within the framework of the <laughs> offense. <laughs> no. I, don't the think, I, think, you, I think you mess up when you try to get into this scoring match. I think for Dallas, their recipe is to play half-court basketball. They're Wisconsin. They're going to slow this thing down. They're going to grind it out and going to try and get into the fourth quarter. They can't outshoot them. They can't outscore them. They won't win like that. No. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be – I'm with you. I, this, hmm. this score shouldn't be close. Right. And first of all, you got Marshawn Lattimore. He's going to be on Amari Cooper. Last week, uh, Josh Norman came to our studio. I said – we asked him on air, what do you think of uh, uh, Amari Cooper? You know, you played him with Amari Cooper, without Amari Cooper. And he's like, yeah, he did good. But – a couple fluke plays last week, that big game that he had. He goes, that was just missed tackles. That wasn't mm. him. Mm. Uh, and I believe you have to score points. As we talk about, Drew Brees is not slowing down. No. He's not, the rules are set up for him to be successful. That's why he's on this record-breaking pace, completion percentage. And I know they got that good defense. Dak, Pre Dak Prescott has enormous pressure on him. Is he going to be able to put up 41 points? Is that what the Saints no, are averaging right now over the last three, four games? They, they, they can't do it. Cam Jordan is going to have a field day because they're going to, he's, they're going to create a one-dimensional offense for the Cowboys. Dak Prescott's going to have to step up. Can he do it? I don't think so. Uh, he can play okay, but I don't think he's going to be able to stay not even close step for step I, with uh, Drew Brees. I don't think you got to score 40, but you damn well better score 30 or 31 points to give your defense a chance. And to me, when you talk about scoring 30, 31 points, that's not staying within the framework. He's going to have to make some He's going to have to make some plays. They just can't hand it to Zeke 50 times and think they're going to win. He's going to have to make some plays. But I'm not necessarily convinced that you guys are making the New Orleans Saints out like they are the best defense in all of football. They have some liabilities in the back end. They had to make a trade to get Eli Apple. Eli Apple is not an upper echelon corner. There are some guys that can be got in the back end. They're going to selectively take their time, play action pass, and they're going to get those guys. I believe Amari Cooper is a difference maker for them. I think we have seen him make an impact on their offense and in the passing game, and I think we'll continue to see it, even though he'll get matched up with Marshawn Lattimore. What we haven't seen, though, Bucky, is Dak take advantage of every opportunity. Never. And, and again, he's going to have to do that. When, when, Am here. when Amari Cooper <laughs> – gets open, it, it can't be overthrown, it can't be thrown out of bounds, it can't be late and give the defensive back a chance to recover. Again, does he have to match Drew B's point for point, pass for pass? No. But on those two or three times when they have a chance to get a chunk play, he's got to be there with the ball. And, and Marcel, you know, you asked me earlier about Lamar Jackson. Are you hating on Dak? Are you rooting against Dak? No, I'm not. But uh, <laughs> his resume roots against him in this matchup. Uh, just looking at it. Look, they played the Philadelphia Eagles in consecutive weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, we're familiar with those scores, right? Dallas, oh, look at this. I mean, look, it's in your division, so I know it's going to be tight, highly contentious. But 27-20. 
Then the Saints said, let's go play that same team, see what happens to them boys. 48 to 7. Come on, man, this thing. <sighs> but it's not in the dome. It, okay. We're, it's not in the dome. The it's it's in Jerry's world, which is going to be like dome 2.0. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not in the dome. You don't have the yin-yang twins and all that stuff <laughs> popping off like they do at the, at the Super I mean, Dome. It's different. it's different. It's different. It's <laughs> different when they play in the dome. They get them in Jerry's world. They're comfortable. I think the Cowboys. Look, you I, think I, the Cowboys I, win or stay Oh, close? I think they win. I think they win. Cowboys win. win. Okay. Hey, okay text me. Text me on Friday. Text you on Friday? You think the Cowboys win? I think the Cowboys win. Why? <laughs> oh, I think they're defense. I don't know, Are you? Hey, no, I'm not hey, but why? Why? The way Dallas plays on defense is conducive to them winning. They play more man-to-man. They're not going to give Drew Brees the opportunity to throw down the seams. Look, as great as Drew Brees has been, when you really look at how they do it, they run first. They get it with their running game, play action. They take it down the seams. Because they can play man-to-man, there won't be the easy windows. I just think the matchup favors Dallas when it comes to their defense versus the Saints offense. The he, thing that I find is, fascinating yeah. about that is I see it as a four. Drew Brees versus Dak Prescott in the fourth quarter and the throws and the play. And then I think when you come down t- to the kicking game, I, I would rather have I, the Cowboys kicker, Mahler or Mayer. He has not been the He gets a little nervous sometimes. Yeah. He gets a little nervous. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's hard for me to see the Cowboys winning this game, but I can see them being competitive and giving a scare because I do like their defense. I think they'll get in to some throwing lanes for uh, uh, Drew Brees, not just in the backfield, but at the line of scrimmage. I think the the defensive line will put some pressure on them, get their hands up. There'll be a tip ball or two. They'll make a couple of plays. Their defense is going to make a couple of plays, but winning this, yeah. that's a bold statement. I, I, absurd, almost, respectfully, <laughs> I say that. Um, I can't, wait, I can't well, wait for you to holler. Well, here's your game plan. Here's about. his game plan. Run Zeke, right, because that's yeah. where it's built. That's their engine. But they're going against the number one rush defense. Oh, that's fine. We're going to exploit the 30th ranked pass defense in New Orleans. Oh, Dak Prescott, like you said, you can't play that safe game plan. Dak has never went out there and said, let me just go for broke and put up the yards, put up the touchdowns necessary. So to exploit their weakness, we're going to have to see a different Dak. And they're going to take away your workhorse more than likely because that's the best rush defense. And even worse, everybody, everybody it's a short season. week. It's a short week. No, Ty- no, no. Ty- Both of them played on Thursday days. last week. Seven, they got seven, seven full Okay, seven well, t- what about Tyron Smith? I heard that he might not even play. Yeah, and I, Cam Jordan, might. I don't know how you guys feel about Cam Jordan. I played him. Nice I, not all good. I think he's a great football player. Yeah. Literally, he is one of the best. We talk about, is he on that Khalil Mack? Is he on J.J. Watts level? I don't know. Not, not quite there, but he's just a step uh, below yeah. them right now. He, he went to Cal. He's, mm-hmm. And he went to Cal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go see Cal. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to put on our thinking caps. Bucky Brooks joins us as we take a deeper look into a sports issue of today. Uh, Marcellus, of course, is an Ivy League graduate uh, uh, from Columbia. So. Uh, we still don't have any proof. I've never seen the diploma. And you won't. Uh, <laughs> you will but not. he says he's an Ivy League graduate. All right, Darnell, bring out uh, Marcellus' special cap. Oh, huh? Uh, he is uh, <laughs> allegedly the smartest person in this segment. Bathe them dirty. Uh, allegedly. All right, let's 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 move to the NFL, where Philip Rivers posted the most accurate game in NFL history Sunday completing 28 of 29 passes in a win over the Cardinals. But Rivers wasn't the only guy on the money this week, with Marcus Mariota posting the second most accurate game in NFL history, going 22 of 23 in last night's loss to the Texans. In fact, this seems to be the year of the accurate passer. With four quarterbacks completing more than 70% of their passes, which is as many as in the previous 23 seasons, Combined. Wow. That makes me, because look, Phillip Rivers did it and they won in a blowout. <clears throat> they beat up Arizona and it was like, oh man, incredible performance, Phillip Rivers. Marcus Mariota does it last night. He gets beat in a blowout. Yeah. And so it makes me think one, it diminishes a bit what Phillip Rivers did when I see a guy the next night damn near do the same thing and get beat. And so I, I'm not sure with the new NFL rules. And the way the passing game has gone and all the short passing and, again, guys, anybody can run over the middle without fear. Uh, Anybody can catch the ball without fear. All this defenseless receiver stuff. I'm not sure if completion percentage is a great uh, indicator of who's playing well at the quarterback position. And so one of the reasons why we wanted to have you here, Bucky, 
is just we I wanted to figure out how should we be evaluating quarterbacks. My take, and I'll get I'll break it down a little bit later, is just like sacks and interceptions. That's how I'm evaluating quarterback. Yeah, I'm going to speed through mine also because I'm excited to hear what Bucky has to say. <laughs> uh, I, I said this before I even got uh, on the show working with Bucky. He's the Rosetta Stone of football. <laughs> Sucker would translate the game for any language, any person out there, man. But in short, for me, I just think the heightened emphasis on the passing game has really created this unintended consequence and also the fact that you're going to get more effective, efficient offenses in the passing game. Everyone is now putting their priority and their focus on the passing games. You're going to see upticks in everything from yardage. You're going to see a completion percentage. It's just a more effective model. But Bucky, Rosetta Stone, let me hear it. No, I, I think you touched on a bunch of different things. The rule changes have made it where more offensive coordinators feel like the best way to move the ball is through the air. And so what these coordinators have done, they've created these short passing games where the ball is coming out, but it's coming out 10 yards or fewer. So now the shorter the pass, the more accurate the throw because the percentage may in your favor that you can be more accurate on a shorter toss. And so the thing that I look at when I'm looking at quarterbacks, completion percentage is one thing, but also look at the yards per attempt. And if you can go even farther, we use next-gen stats to see air yards. How far is the ball actually traveling from his hand, from the line of scrimmage to the intended target? If they're moving the, the ball beyond 10 yards, then you see, like, hey, they're really taking high-risk, high-reward throws, and it's resulting in these big explosive games. When you're looking at quarterback play and efficiency, it goes back to the same thing. Touchdowns, interceptions. High touchdowns, low interceptions. Those guys that really have those high ratios typically play at a high level. Drew Brees, you talk about 20 plus touchdowns, only two interceptions. So I want to see the points come from the passing game, but I don't want to see the giveaways because turnovers are the biggest deciding factor in games. And you just talked about it. So what you're saying, the long handoff, as we say. Uh, and I remember when the game started to change. Uh, we saw this evolution, and we saw the results and consequences of the same evolution. Look what they've done to skilled players. And skilled mm -hmm. position players, fullback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, uh, obviously the quarterback. They started to say, look, Hey, fullbacks, get out of here. Yep. You guys have the toughest time catching the ball out the backfield. Let's just be real. Hey, uh, running back, if you don't catch the ball out of the backfield, you won't be top echelon. Uh, look at the top backs. Gurley, Kamara, Zeke, like they're Kareem Hunt. They're all catching the ball yes. out the backfield. And now they're looking at the tight end position. And they're like, look, brother. If you're not 6'6", 240 playing off-season basketball, we don't need you. All this power plowing uh, tight end position, they're attacking them now to create long handoff situations, which increases the completion percentage. Look, Bucky, I want your take on this. I had him do a board of the top 10 quarterbacks, uh, a graphic, top 10 quarterbacks in terms of low number of sacks taken and interceptions thrown. And when you look at that, Drew Brees, to me, is having the best season at the quarterback position, and voila. Mm. Combined sacks and interceptions, only 12. And so to me, when you why I factor in sacks is because who can read the defense quickly and get the ball out of his hands? And yeah, the Saints have a very good offensive line. But look at who's number two, Andrew Luck at 23. They don't have a great offensive right. line. Andrew Luck is moving that football quickly and you know when you think about Andrew Luck and I think it, it speaks to the way the game is changing Frank Reich has done a great job of changing the way the passing game is when Andrew Luck throws the ball short and intermediate they get everyone out and the ball is out quick when they take shots you notice two and three man routes so that means a guy like Marcellus can't get to the mm -mm. quarterback because he's facing max protection yeah Smart coordinators are doing a great job of setting their quarterbacks up for success which is why you're seeing so many quarterbacks play at a higher level yeah but that list <sighs> I mean, you did your homework, you did yeah. your research, you got here early, okay, <laughs> respect for that. But uh, I didn't see Patrick Mahomes on that list uh, in terms of great quarterback play. Drew Brees was number one, that makes sense. Uh, can I see the list again one more time? But uh, what I've learned from playing against quarterbacks is the best offensive lineman I ever faced 
was a smart quarterback, <laughs> was Peyton Manning. Like, Peyton Manning didn't care who was in front of him. Uh, I, I'm looking if my LASIK surgery is, is <laughs> I don't see Patrick Mahomes. But Patrick Mahomes is not. He's got 32 combined. He's just off but, the and top I, 10. And, and is that Joe Flacco in tied second place? Joe Flacco is in help. third place. You got to remember. Third place, that's 23. Out, he sat out a couple of games. Oh, okay, okay. And so that's the same thing with Ryan Deshaun Watson, you just told me he was going to be no, a no, no. winner. And look, I'm about to tell you that. <laughs> okay. That's what's interesting. All right, let me hear. Of the starting quarterbacks in the league, he's the worst at 48 combined All sacks facts, and interceptions. Yeah. Yeah, he's thrown a high number of interceptions. He's taken a lot of sacks, particularly early in the season when they were getting beaten up. Mm. It's And again, it was, I knew this this afternoon when I was arguing about the Texans and all that. That's the red flag with Deshaun Watson. And, but I, I think it's something that, remember, Deshaun Watson only got to play six or seven, or he mm -hmm. didn't get to play a full season last year, coming off an injury. I think there's some shaking off of rust. I expect Deshaun Watson to play at a more efficient level the latter half of the season than he did in the first half of the season. But, yeah, when you look at the rest of the guys at the bottom of the list, he, Deshaun Watson's at 48. Mm. Dak Prescott, yeah. 47. Yeah. Uh, Eli Manning, 47. Derek Carr, 47. Matt Stafford, 45. Again, it's a telltale sign of good quarterback play. It's somewhere where Deshaun Watson has to improve. But, but again, when I look, I think we've gone from, and Marcellus, you make the point, we used to look at high sacks and it's just the offensive line. Right. I think Peyton Manning has taught us, <laughs> no, no, the quarterback can make a huge difference, and that's another way to evaluate quarterback play. Just looking at your list, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, Phillip Rivers, Roethlisberger on there, guys that have played for a long time, they understand the internal clock to get the ball out. They can protect the offensive line. You've heard Tom Brady say, why would I want to give up this game now when I have all the answers to the test? It's their ability to quickly read the defense and get it out. And so veteran quarterbacks should play better because they have more experience. They know how to play the game. I think it's more impressive when you see a young quarterback on the list. It's either his ability or the coach's ability to craft an offense that allows him to play fast. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're going back to the laws of nature now. The first <laughs> law of nature is survival, you know, uh, self-preservation. And if you're a smart quarterback, you learn that. I love how you mm -hmm. said internal clock because before you thrive, you got to survive. And it's too many times I, – I entered NFL when there was a Drew Bledsoe, Vinny Testaverde, Old Marino – and for whatever reason, they didn't even want an internal clock because they wanted the seven-step drop, let you run the long fly routes. And as a defender, we were like, this is amazing. One, you don't even have to have the same hip turn on a seven-step drop because even if the tackle think he's doing a great job, you're washing me right back to that quarterback who's 10 yards deep. Uh, I saw Jared Goff after his game in the post-game press conference against the Chiefs say, I've been working on my drops, my distance from center which is amazing because a lot of times you can protect yourself if you just stay in that bubble. But stay tight and make sure that your offensive guards get proper support and anchor, no push. You stay right there, you're tucked. Two, three seconds, get rid of it, offensive line, almost obsolete. Here's what's changed from the days you're talking about, Marino and those guys. Used to be one of the greatest signs of great quarterback play was toughness in the pocket. Mm. It was the guy, Phil Simms was tremendous at holding the ball, giving his receiver an extra shot, extra chance to make a play, and releasing the ball and taking that delivery sack. Yeah. Well, now they've virtually illegalized the delivery sack. They hit after the quarterback just released the ball, and it's no longer that great sign of toughness. Peyton Manning was the best quarterback in the league for a long time, and he hated taking sacks and would fall down, and it made it okay for everybody else not to be that tough in the pocket. The game has really changed, but I'm glad we had this conversation. Gives you something to think about when it comes to quarterback play. We're joined now by Fox NBA analyst Jim Jackson. Let's move to the NBA, where James Harden went off for 54 last night, and Eric Gordon added 36. Giving the Rockets the second highest scoring game from a backcourt in NBA history, and they still somehow lost to the Wizards. But that's hardly the strangest thing going on in this year's NBA, where things aren't shaking out the way anyone imagined so far. With the Clippers, the top seed in the West, <laughs> the Vaunted Celtics, the sixth seed in the East, what? 
The Rockets, Spurs, and Pelicans and Jazz all currently out of the playoffs. And the Milwaukee Bucks lead the NBA in scoring for the first time since Richard Nixon was president. <laughs> the NBA is crazy. I can't figure out anything this <laughs> NBA season. I've been monitoring and tracking it. No one, nothing makes sense to me. I think the new NBA rules are an adjustment for everybody. Uh, you know, everybody's on the perimeter, can score at, at, at will. And maybe the Orlando Magic are a 500 team. Yeah, they're good. Uh, the Utah Jazz are out of the playoff. The Sacramento Kings are 10 right. and 10. Yeah. This is, I, I can't make sense of it. I love it. <laughs> they, they reshuffled the deck in a way that gave us interest, hope, and something to look forward to in this journey, even though we may see the same inevitable destination, mm -hmm. which is Golden State wins. But last year, the complaint during the regular season was what? Man, we know what's going to happen. It was kind of a boring regular season, exciting playoffs. We saw Golden State go to seven. We were like, whoa, they were on the brink of elimination. So respect for the playoffs continue now into this regular season. But this, this entire season has to start with the best story, the biggest story, the Clippers. Let's be real. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> oh, 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 no, 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 no. Oh, what? Oh, just be real, How is that Jimmy, the biggest because, story? Because every time I hear the game of basketball <laughs> told in narrative, it's a star-driven league. Right. And a team without a star is the best team in the NBA what West in the West? What what which Toronto? Which conference is going to win the championship this year? West or East? <laughs> yeah. and which, we're number one in which conference? Oh, we're the best team on. in the NBA. The richest owner, best team <laughs> in the NBA, best mascot. Everything is going through Clip City, Chip City. Amazing, <laughs> mind blowing. Listen, Marcellus, we're yeah. only a quarter way through the season. What that okay, mean? so that's that's a nice chunk. That, no, but, mean, but but it's given. I think back up. <laughs> you're, you're right. It's it's a crazy season because I think I've always said this about the Western Conference. It was overrated from this perspective. At the top, it was really good. But to me, I still didn't trust Portland. I really didn't trust Utah. Denver is playing well. Minnesota, you couldn't trust, okay? So if there were teams within the Western Conference, even though you considered it deep, that when it came down to it, you're like, okay, so why couldn't the Lakers be in the fourth or fifth position right. based on what's going on? So I'm kind of not surprised by it. But what I am surprised is that you got the, the Rockets down 13. Now, I knew it wasn't sustainable because I played for Mike D'Antoni. When they didn't, you know, sign back Trevor Ariza, for whatever reason, they didn't want to pay him. That's fine. Go find a player that's similar to his acumen, also the way he plays, that fills in the gaps. They didn't want to do it. So, to me, the volatility in the Western Conference is like the biggest story because we thought Golden State would be there. We thought Houston would be there. Teams, Portland would be there. But yeah. yet and still, Utah, after their run, would be there. But also, to me, I, I put up a board here in regards to your point about the scoring and the rules, okay? Look at this. Seven 50-point games. And keep in mind, hmm. Clay and it was Steph and Clay or Steph and, and um, KD had 50 before the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So within these last four years, it's been seven games of 50 already, which goes back to the rule changes. Yeah. It's no rim protector, okay, right now. Everything is spread out. So... The question is, is it sustainable and really good for the game? I don't know in regards to really high-quality basketball, because right now we're not seeing it. We're seeing a lot of scoring, but is it really high-quality? And that's the question that we're going to have to get into once we get deeper into the season and, the, the, you know, the, the committee has to look at is really not a high-quality of basketball. I, I wonder on that point if that's why Boston is struggling so much is because... The, the things that Brad Stevens used to always bring to the table mm -hmm. aren't as valuable now in a league where high-quality play, I'm not sure if it's being rewarded well, Memphis, right now. Well, Memphis, the way they still play, they're, still, they're in fourth. They're going to grind you out. So the old school still kind of works. I think the dynamic in Boston is this. I was hurt my third year, average 26. But when I came back, I wasn't the same player. And that hurt our growth in Dallas similar to what you're seeing right now with Gordon Hayward. Because now you got to mm -hmm. figure out what to do with Gordon. Jalen Brown is out right now, but he's been struggling because his, his minutes have, ha, hasn't been consistent. Okay, Terry Rozier, his minutes haven't been consistent since Kyrie got back. So they're struggling with that whole dynamic of, okay, how do we get our young players to continue to mature, but yet and still, 
we got to figure out where Gordon Hayward sits. Yeah, I love that point because that was something that was anticipated actually coming into mm -hmm. how are you going to get all these minutes and, and be able to delegate them properly to keep the attitude, the enthusiasm, yep. and everybody's game uh, continue to roll. And what's happening is you're trying to protect somebody, and it just interrupts what everybody else is doing in terms of flow. Right. That, that, and you're talking about Gordon Hayward. Gordon yeah, Hayward, Gordon, yeah. yeah. Because that's the pro. If Gordon Hayward were playing at a high level, I think issues. everybody else would be satisfied with diminished issues. Right. But when you out there like, Side eye in a white dude. It is not his fault because, again, I've been there. When I couldn't explode off my left leg after I tore my ankle up, it was different, okay? And it took me half of that season to kind of really get my confidence back to the second half. But it affected, and you may remember a guy, Tony Dumas, UMKC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He thought he should be the starter. So we had all this influx going on because I was playing okay, but not to the level I was a year before. He was saying, hey, I need to be in the lineup. Other team members were saying that. So you saw our growth get stunted. And that's what you see in, in Boston right now. All right, real quickly. What do we, come May and June, what are we going to see? Golden State Golden versus State. Boston? <laughs> Golden State versus Toronto? I, I think, I think because of Brad Stevens and the makeup they have, they'll be right back in hunt. I think they're, they're digging themselves in too much of a hole to kind of leapfrog Toronto. But again, you want to see those two in the Eastern Conference anyway. So whoever comes out of that, I think gives Golden State a run for their money. But at the end of the day, it's... Yeah, it's right still, right still going to be Golden we're, State, brother. We're going to be in seven. Western go, Conference we're, Finals. We're, we're who, the Clippers? Are you, are you kidding me? Jimmy. We're going to put something on it right I'm now. everything Okay, on let's it. put something on it right Steve now. Steve Ballmer got my back. He got the most Let's put sports. something on it that Golden State and the Clippers in the Western Conference Finals. Is that what you're saying? What you say? Uh, why you stutter? Uh, you, you, you heard what I said. You heard what I said. What you stuttering for? I, Clip City, Chip City, that's all I want to do. Just put something on it. <laughs> no, no. I got Just put something on it. I got kids to feed. I ain't had that yet. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Time to get antisocial. Mm. My favorite segment, our social media manager, oh. Darnell Smith, here to walk us through these Twitter streets. What oh. streets? <laughs> I stay in the streets. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we can tell. No Warren Central hate today, Marcellus. You had my people riled up. Yeah. Man, they should yeah. be happy in, in their success and <laughs> their championship. Don't let me bring y'all down. You know we keep it real on the far east side. I try to Marcellus. tell them, man. Be I try to tell careful. them. Watch out, man. What is that? <laughs> That's called the east side G. It don't make me start. I don't, don't want to get loose today. You don't know about that. What y'all playing? Darts? And oh, country? My, <laughs> all right. It's not going to start on you. All right, Darnell. What's what cracking dude? out there? What's... Yeah, we're going to start with Baker Mayfield who received a lot of backlash for snubbing his former head coach, Hugh Jackson, after the Browns beat the Bengals on Sunday. Former NFL player Damian Woody pointed out that Mayfield transferred from Texas Tech to Oklahoma in college. But Baker said on Instagram that it wasn't the same thing and also took a jab at Hugh, calling him fake, and reminded everyone he lost 30 games with the Browns. Mm. Guys, does Baker need to get off social media? <sighs> Listen, man, you know what? I, the guy is authentic. Mm -hmm. that, that is who he is. He planted the flag when he was in college. He grabbed his crotch when he was in college. He ran from the police when he was in college. <laughs> Baker Mayfield's got a little attitude, man. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, he can fit in on our side of town. Yeah, he's on the east side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Baker Mayfield, do that thing. He was just yeah, doing it. Yeah, late, yeah. Hey, he about that life. He want that smoke. Look, I am all for if someone comes at you, you can come back at them, especially on social media, man. Let's not take this too seriously. Yeah. That said, uh, it, it did fuel the conversation and change the balance uh, in terms of Baker Mayfield was looking great before this came out. And now it's like, okay, we get it, Baker. What you're saying is too bullseye. What do they say in comedy? Nothing is funny if it's too bullseye. <laughs> I can't say Jason Whitlock, you fat. I can say you kind of big. And then it's not, <laughs> oh, no, that's actually funny. My bad. So I take all that back. But, you know, the point is, we get it, Baker. You ain't got to say it. Let us say it for you. You know, I'm going to let these east siders look right. you, my son. You keep messing Bring with it here. to the west side. <laughs> fly them out here. Why? Yeah. And am <laughs> Fly my little cousin Josh out here. He'll tighten you up. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right, right. Now, what's next? Yeah, moving on to Le'Veon Bell, who has been living it up off the field this season after not signing his franchise tender with the Steelers. Bell stumbled upon this post by the NFL Instagram account on Monday about the Indianapolis coach quarterback Andrew Luck, who was having a huge comeback season, and commented on it. Just imagine. <laughs> Obviously, this drove social media to some speculations about where Bell would end up next season. 
Guys, would you like to see Le'Veon and Luck playing together? Love it. Love it. I would love it. Yes, sir. Oh, I think this is the great landing spot for him. I think it would be great for Andrew Luck. I think it would be great for Le'Veon Bell. I think it would be great for the league. Uh, Le'Veon Bell and Andrew Luck would be a dynamic duo. Uh, love it. Yeah, go on, along with the tight end, Eric Ebron. I mean, that, yeah. that, that entire attack would be something stellar. Uh, look. I think he had the security of knowing that he had an opportunity, he had a landing spot before you even go out there and hold out an entire season. I'm not saying it is Indianapolis, but they're rumored to be one of the top teams after him. Uh, he lands there with Andrew Luck playing it the way he is as a comeback player of the year. Oh, man, that's going to be special. Super Bowl. Mm. Super Bowl, I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see, see I'm not much of a Colts fan. Darnell's a huge Colts yes. fan. When I was growing up, the Colts weren't there. Uh, they but, were in Baltimore, but, right? Yeah, they were in yeah. Baltimore. They came my senior year of high school. I was already a Rams fan, and now I'm a Chiefs fan. But uh, I, I would, my mother and all the... Been I lived in Kansas City for 16 like, years. As a, a kid, a I was a Rams fan. fan. I moved to Kansas City Chiefs fan. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> what? what? Uh, you named the whole AFC yeah. Central. <laughs> 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 all right, man, let's move to the hardwood. Yeah. Where social media is still talking about the Draymond and KD fight from earlier this month. Mm. But it looks like the team has moved on, winning their last three games. Last night, KD dropped 49 points against the Magic, and Draymond looked like his biggest fan on the sidelines, cheering them on. Are y'all buying that Draymond and KD are all good now? Uh, yeah, because I think it's now they've come to a, an agreement. We here to win a championship this year. There it is. We here to get our third. Mm -hmm. And nothing else matters and what happens after we get our next championship is something totally indifferent and so yeah Draymond Green is all in on this year and I think this is authentic I think it's authentic as well and it's it's sad that Draymond's in that place we've all been there before uh, you can't win for losing so if Draymond is sitting there on the bench wide eye like whatever and he scored 49s we're like oh they still beefing but then if Draymond jumps up and supports him oh he's faking the funk he don't really care about him like that Draymond do you man I know that you all on board for winning another championship y'all figure that up figure it out after the season you and Draymond ain't cool don't, don't, don't try to oh, he <laughs> don't want to see me in Vegas you know how this do <laughs> I, I, did my no, I did want to know was that clapping thorough was that was that thorough is that considered thorough that clapping nah it was a little <laughs> a little extra he put he put a little tax on it just to let you know I like KD <laughs> it's oh, all man. love though all right Darnell what's next yeah staying in the NBA where Ben Simmons and model Kendall Jenner mm. have been dating off and on since the beginning of the summer Friday night, Kendall showed up courtside to support Simmons, and the Sixers lost their first home game of the season. Fans put the blame on Kendall, and someone actually started a petition to ban her from the Wells Fargo Center. Guys, this petition has over 3,000 signatures already. <laughs> Do you believe in this Kardashian curse? Heck no. <sighs> no, I, I don't believe in no. the Kardashian curse, and I want to know who signed this petition for Kendall Jenner not to be in, in the same building I'm in. There you go. <laughs> I'm with you. Right. I'll be like, oh, we got to veto this legislation. <laughs> Hell no. Nah. She, she's beautiful, first and, of all. <laughs> she's beautiful. And look, they said she allegedly cheated on, on Ben Simmons or whatever. She's available. It sounds like to me, too. Beautiful and available. Green light. Bring her into the building. <laughs> We're locked. Let me just say one thing. Uh, I don't know what type of ammo you think you got. You got no shot. You know, I mean, <laughs> when I say the bet now is a, uh, are plus 9,000 million, Let me tell you, you something. Ain't got no I've shot. been counted out so many times. <laughs> if I listen to all the haters, I would still be a virgin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that image right now <laughs> messed my whole day up. Next one, Darnell. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> all right. Now, last but not oh, least, man. Marcel, your favorite coach, Doc Rivers, there he is. was on Undisputed this morning and talking about the success of the Clippers and why they're playing so well. Mm. Take a listen. We get along. Like, our team is, it's a team that um, they kind of stay out of each other's way. They want each guy to be great, and they don't mind if he's great tonight or you're great the next night. They don't care. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as we can keep that, uh, then we're going to continue to be good. Is he taking a shot here at Lob City? Damn right he is, man. And, and, <laughs> and look, it, it's been well reported that Blake and CP3 had their issues. And then Austin. Uh, Austin with DeAndre. <laughs> right. And then there was all these little factions. It, it's not even the individuals. 
It's those surrounding them that always wants to make an assessment of the situation. That really gets you in trouble. Just like the athlete, it's the entourage, it's your gatekeepers, it's your, it's your team that's like, oh, well, we have brands to protect and we got to go out there and do it a certain way. This team without stars is just like, look, man, we're going to ball. Simple as that. I think what Doc is saying as well is that, look, man, he's been under a lot of heat mm -hmm. as a coach, as an executive. And I think he's saying, you know what, it's finally nice just to come to work and to be able to coach without having all the Mickey Mouse drama and chemistry issues. We can just go out here and play basketball, enjoy each other's company. I'm not micromanaging whether Blake is fighting the equipment manager <laughs> and all this other stuff. Chris Paul not getting along with DeAndre. We're just out here playing basketball. It's an enjoyable experience for Doc. Yep, and it shows. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval rating for J.J. Watt. Don't look at him. <laughs> Man, <laughs> what, uh, what, we got soul playing. What? <laughs> Here we go again, right? <laughs> I look a mess. You ain't heard. You ain't never heard your mama say that I was the highest one in the family. <laughs> you ain't never heard him say that. Now. I have heard that. Hold on, wait, wait a minute. Didn't just watch nigga fly a plane. <laughs> he even flew it upside down. Yeah, that's true. Snoop flew a plane. W what airline do you work for, sir? I, you know, I, I, I work. For, I, I work for Gunny Airlines. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what? I work, I work for Gunny. You know, I keep it Gunny. Gunny. You know what I'm gunny. saying? You mean Gully? Yeah, Gully. <laughs> gully, Gunny. So old ass. <laughs> Tuskegee. <Look> uh, <laughs> let's check out a highlight from really? our conversation earlier about J.J. Watt. Oh, you look a mess. What's amazing about J.J. Watt is. Most office alignment have already given up a sack to him as soon as they see him on the field. Yeah. He's a disruptor. When you talk about playoff football, special igniting plays, J.J. Watt still is the standard for all the And that's what I thought we saw last night. Marcus Mariota played a hell of a game. But J.J. Watt and Covington and that pass rush knocked this dude down six times. Those six sacks, they're almost like turnovers now. Sacks are. They're so valuable. All right, so earlier, Uncle Jimmy, I was telling everybody about I have this sixth scent, and I my scent right now is I smell a championship for the Houston Texans. What do you hey, smell in that mug, <laughs> Uncle Jimmy? What the hell going on? Y'all in my personal business again. Man, I'm on your flight. You better no, chill no, out. No, look at right now, we concerned with what scents is going on up there around you. <laughs> you know what what first of all, let me tell you Texas. something. Yeah. Mm. First of all, you a lie. <laughs> and the truth ain't in. <laughs> Why you can tell that mess to all these other people around here, Jason. <laughs> you know I know the story. Mm. The story about what? Uh -oh. I know what movie Spielberg wanted you to play in. <laughs> I know what it was. Don't tell us. Man, he wanted him to play in the colored people. <laughs> you the, mean the, the, color, the color purple? The colored people. <laughs> Man, it was a love story about Oprah and Jason and a pot of greens or something. I don't know how it happened, man. <laughs> that was a short story. That didn't last long. <laughs> it didn't last long. You know what I'm saying, man? You ain't got no damn six cent, man. You got to stop that. <laughs> you got to stop that, man. If you had a six cent, mm. you'd look at the Houston Texans and you'd say, I seen injured people. <laughs> <laughs> What? That's what I was sick. What you you say I see injured people, nephew. I see injured people. And I'm so sick of seeing that boy up there. Y'all talk about that boy all day long. <laughs> JJ, JJ Watt. Oh, JJ Watt. Man, JJ Watt ain't nothing but Rob Gronkowski with a GED. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he is. The boys stay hurt. Both of them together stay hurt more than a group of fifth graders playing dodgeball with Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> 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 all by myself now, right? <laughs> huh? I'm telling you, man, I see, when you come to the Houston Texans, I see injured people, man. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Did Deshaun Watson, did he not tear up his knee, signing autographs after practice? <laughs> <laughs> did Jamie Clowning I skip there. his whole college career because he couldn't stay healthy. <laughs> There's some truth to yeah. that. Some truth I'm just that. asking. Itty bitty so part. I'm telling y'all, man, when you come to the Houston, Texas, yes. I see injured people. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't depend on injured people yeah. to take you into the playoffs. Oh, man. That's you true. understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir, sir, yes. I think so the Sixth Sense is the right movie for this. Okay. <laughs> see, the Texans is Bruce Willis. Mm. <laughs> they run around looking for McCulley Culkin <laughs> what? So he can tell them that they did. Holy <laughs> you mean Holy uh, Haley? McCulley Coke. Oh, Holy J Haley. McCulley Coke. They ain't yeah. all the same, man. Bottom <laughs> line, I'm telling you, 
<laughs> Marcellus? Yes. I see Angie P. <laughs> Can I see your bracelet? I know the first time I ever seen that bracelet. Can we I gotta see? get to our approval ratings for man. JJ Watt. We gotta that. get to our <laughs> approval rating for JJ Watt. I'll get you some. I, I'll Look, see you, man. He's a GOAT. He's a GOAT. I got him at an 87, 25 job performance, 22 all time greatness. GOAT. 23 character, authenticity. He's a he's a he heavy on social media. A little too much for you. A little skeptical. Hold 87. On. Oh man, look, I gotta make uh, true uh, ghost that a fat goat, big goat, 94. Rolling. How you gonna get that dude a 23 in character when he raised 37 million dollars in like three days? Me. Come on, man. That's Everybody 25. got secrets. Me. Everybody got <laughs> secrets. Hey, <laughs> JJ Watt, man. I was looking at my range. JJ been the treasure. Trust me, man. Respect. I see injured people. <laughs> That's all I'm telling you.